All rise. We will be. The International Criminal Court is now in session. The Dance of the International. Eight of word. Please be seated. Boy was as well. Thank you very much. Court Officer, the case, please. Thank you, Mr. President. The situation in the Republic of Kenya, in the case of the prosecutor against William Samuel Ruto and Joshua Arabsang, ICC 0109-0111, we are in open session. Thank you. Appearances? Good morning, Mr. President, Your Honours. For the prosecution, appearances remain the same. Good morning, Your Honours. On our side, the appearances remain the same. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honours. Uh, Mr. Sang's team is constituted of myself, Katwa Keegan, Caroline Busman, Logan Hambrick, Hona Lanham, and Marianne, our uh, intern. Thank you. Uh, and we are the same as yesterday. No change. And in Nairobi, I noticed the presence of Mr. Njuguna on yes. the end of the video link. Yes, Mr. President. Thank you. Prosecutor? Morning, Your Honors. Uh, this morning, uh, the prosecution would like to make an application to have the witness who's been standing testifying before the court Witness 495 declared hostile. Now, the reasons uh, underlying this request are uh, basically the fact that the witness has uh, initially made some serious allegations against the OTP. I'm not saying that this is determinative in this question of whether the witness is hostile or not, but it's certainly a factor to be considered. And in addition to that, the witness has also departed in a very significant manner from his prior statement to the prosecution. Now, essentially, the witness has claimed during his testimony that the OTP fabricated the statement, 17-page statement that we've been uh, asking him questions on uh, for the last day and a half. This is, to say the least, a very uh, incredible claim on the part of the witness. Uh, the questioning, uh, we put the witness, uh, to the witness certain questions on the matter, and the witness has stated that uh, not only was the investigator part of this fabrication, but also a trial attorney who was present uh, at the location. Also, the witness has, uh, as I've just stated, departed systematically uh, from his prior statement. He gave initially in the month of, uh, from the 8th to the 11th, 2012, to the prosecution, a 17-page statement. Uh, I'll not go through every section of that statement because we did go through that exercise with the witness already. But what I can say is that, save for the personal information, information that's found in the section entitled Background, paragraphs 14 to 22, save for some of that personal information, the witness has completely disavowed all the rest of the relevant and incriminating evidence that he offered to the prosecution during those four days of interview. Now, the evidence which he's disavowed uh, in the last day and a half is quite important. It's in, uh, evidence regarding rallies that he would have attended, evidence regarding meetings that would have been held prior to the post-election violence in his region, and most importantly, it's what happened on the 30th and the 31st of December, 2007. That is to say, immediately after the election results were announced in his region. Now, in his prior testimony, prior statement to the prosecution, and that's on pages 11 to 13 of his statement, 0246 to 0248, the witness gave a wealth of details on what happened immediately after the pronouncement of the election results in his region. People calling meetings, what was said during the meetings, the exact time on which he attended the meetings, 
who was chairing the meetings, the people involved in the meetings, what was stated, and more importantly, what was decided, what would happen as a result of uh, the election results and the fact that the Kikuyus had allegedly stolen the votes. So that would have been the 30th of December. He also claims, he also gave information, quite important information to the prosecution regarding the 31st of December 2007. I guess, yeah, it may be safe at this stage to speak in terms of what the statement says. And the witness has not denied that he signed the statement. So let's just safely speak in those terms. So the statement says this. This is a statement of the witness. There's no doubt that this is the statement of the witness. Let us not speak in terms of those who say they're the truth that you know. Do you understand what I'm, what I'm saying? Maybe you will consult with Mr. Steinberg who wants to talk to you. Indeed, Your Honor, I'm guided by the Chamber. Now, essentially, the, the evidence that we have from the 31st of December 2007 that the, that the prosecution says the witness provided to the OTP during the interview is evidence of what happened in his particular region regarding the meetings that occurred and the actions uh, that were implemented afterwards. Now, uh, there are specific paragraphs that deal, and this is uh, page 0248, 31st of December 2007, that deal with the person who was allegedly chairing the meetings, it's person number nine on the PIS, uh, the people that had been uh, who had been uh, designated uh, to lead the uh, youth in uh, subsequent attacks and where the places, the exact places where the attacks occurred, and that would have been paragraph 78 in the statement. More importantly, on the bottom of this page, 0248, meeting at Ziwa Sirikwa, so you have paragraph 79 to 86 of the witness's original statement, now, the witness claims the information that the witness provided to the OTP at the time was that he had actually uh, attended a meeting that would have occurred in uh, Ziwa Sirikwa along with other, along with other youth, a certain number of youth, and he had also attended, uh, when he attended these meetings, certain individuals had spoken. Now, these are names that I put to the witness, and the witness, uh, all along his testimony, has denied uh, almost every, almost, knowing almost every name that has been put to him by the prosecution. In fact, for all of them, save one or two of them, people who are recognized in the community, the witness says that this is the first time in court that he's heard those names. That's, uh, that's quite difficult. And what is important about the evidence that the witness provided to the OTP during these four days of testimony regarding the meeting at Ziwa Sirikwa is that it is essentially uh, noted by the investigators that the information would have been that these people reunited and meeting in Ziwa Sirikwa, the youth from there would have been sent out, transported with lorries to Eldoret. Now, Eldoret obviously is a place that concerns this chamber and the charges deal with Eldoret. Uh, youth that would have uh, gone to Chepkoilel campus, it's a branch of Moyes University located in Kimumu. So this coincides with the testimony of other witnesses who have testified before this court. Now, all this to say, Your Honor, is that the witness provided what we believe is relevant information, relevant incriminating, incriminating evidence to the prosecution on those four days. Now, the witness claims before the court uh, that uh, the OTP fabricated all this evidence. Now, save for his personal information, he's disavowed all the almost entirety of his statement, relevant incriminating evidence. So for those reasons, we believe that this witness should be declared hostile by the chamber so that the prosecution can get to the root of the matter, to the bottom of this uh, story of the witness. Now, the prosecution has operated with neutral questions. I understand there has been a certain leeway in asking uh, more uh, 
different type of questions to the witness to try and arrive at the truth. But at this moment, the prosecution has exhausted those means of trying to reach the truth with neutral type questions. What the prosecution is basically asking is to have the capability of having leading questions to be able to cross-examine the witness and to be able to put to the witness other significant and relevant material that will demonstrate to this chamber as to the specific reasons why the witness is now in court disavowing his prior statement. Now the prosecution is in possession of uh, recorded material, it's direct evidence, wherein the witness, this witness, witness P495, in one specific instance. Uh, let's, let's stop it there. Okay. Let's not go into evidence you have to continue the witness, but if, if you are given the leeway to do that, then we'll see. But let's not start putting on record ahead of time specific evidence you may have to do that. What I was merely doing, uh, Your Honor, is explaining the purpose for which, uh, one of the purposes for which we wish to have this witness declared hostile is to confront him with material that we have. I, I will not go into the details if the Chamber does not want me to go into details, but it's essentially material that will demonstrate to the Chamber the specific reasons why, and it will become quite clear as to why the witness here before the court is giving this explanation and given this story of fabrication by the OTP of, uh, of a witness statement. So that, we say, is quite important. And this is one of the reasons why we wish the witness to be declared hostile. Uh, in sum, Your Honor, I have not, nothing further to... I have nothing further to add on the question of substantive issues, but what's also important to notice in the, the way the witness has been testifying is that on several occasions, even with the story that he's given the chamber, there have been significant contradictions, one of them being uh, conversations with uh, person number two on the PIS. At one point, the witness said that he had conversed with her on the month of August and afterwards in December only to say afterwards that he had also spoken with her during the taking. Mr. Mr. Garcia, you see, what I was trying to hint the last time is when we made a ruling on similar application made in relation to witness 604, where we laid down certain factors that should guide um, the determination of whether or not to declare the witness hostile. Uh, it should be enough for you to argue that any or some of those factors haven't met and leave it at that. Indeed, Your Honor. The uh, Chamber had uh, given a list of five factors, if I'm correct. Uh, also stated that these were not exhaustive, and indeed one of these factors was the fact of systematically and deliberately departing from a prior station. Uh, par statement, sorry. I believe that in this case, indeed, the witness has systematically and deliberately departed from, from his par statement in very important manners regarding relevant incriminating evidence. Uh, he has also obviously the, supported the defense case. In the question, in the manner of his demeanor, what I can say, and this is another factor that was uh, indicated by the chambers, that the witness does seem to be evasive on certain questions or response in the same manner. It seems like he's been tailoring evidence, and also of importance is the fact that ultimately the witness refused to meet with the OTP for a preparation meeting. So for all of the uh, reasons that I've just given, Your Honor, I feel that this is a clear case where the witness is hostile to the prosecution, the calling party, and he should be declared hostile so the prosecution can have the tools to arrive at the truth in this matter. Thank you. Mr. Hooper. <clears throat> well, um, the first thing to note is, is, of course, it's very well for my friend to wring his hands over the quality of this witness, but it's a quality of his witness. This is the quality or the kind of quality of witness that the prosecution are basing or seeking to base their case. In terms of my friend's application, in the light of this chamber's previous decision and the criterion that were 
the criteria that were applied in respect of the last witness. I have no reasonable basis upon which to object to my friend's submission or to oppose my friend's submission. However, in having this witness declared adverse, it remains for you, the Chamber, to determine to what extent you feel you will be assisted by such an exercise, given such a witness as this. And that's entirely a matter for the Chamber. And now, isn't that a matter of submissions at the end of the day? Or do we have to deal with that now? Um, I I submit that you as a chamber have a, have a general discretion as to whether you want to hear any more from a witness. And that's entirely a matter for you. If it goes on, the importance is to focus on the matters that are core to this case, which are, of course, probative and relevant um, evidence relating to the crimes that the accused face. Uh, what does, can we, to, 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 to what extent are we free as a chamber at this stage to stop an examiner in chief, say stop there, uh, we don't want to hear any more from your witness, the witness is discharged. Can we freely do that before the examiner-in-chief has indicated that he or she is done with a witness. This is a witness for the prosecution. Prosecution has elicited, has gone some way with the witness, and they're saying, well, we're not done with the witness. See what happened the prosecutor to say, well, given the testimony of this witness, uh, judges, there's no further question, and we stop it there. They haven't said that. They are saying they want to ask the witness more questions because they believe there is something more to explore. Can we stop them doing that? I submit you, you have a, a great dis discretion, uh, and like most discretions, it runs on a continuum from the blindingly obvious to, to, to not. Um, and it's not for me to submit, I think, at this stage, where on that continuum you may be. But I'm not ruling out that there are or could be occasions when judges at this stage may, may turn to the calling party and just say, well, we're, we're not going to be assisted any further in terms of fact-finding on the core issues that matter in this case by this witness. And, and certainly at least uh, knock the ball back, at the very least, to the calling party to consider whether, for example, they want to go on. So that, that kind of situation can arise. Now, whether it can arise in this particular instance is entirely a matter for, 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 you, for you, the judges. Um, but what we're going to, I anticipate, um, find from the prosecution, as, as I well know, is that the witness will be confronted with evidence of interference, interference of him and his interference of others. Um, and to what extent you, the bench, are going to be assisted by that in terms of participation by particular individuals in post-election violence is, is a matter, of course, for you, the bench. It may be it's a matter that you'd wish to resolve later in the case than at this juncture, but I'm not, I am submitting that your discretion is a very broad and wide one. And one of the difficulties here is that an essential part of Mr. Garcia's application, or any application of this kind, is that there's been a, a departure from the truth. And a prosecutor with a witness who he considers has departed from the truth um, is fully in, entitled, uh, and perhaps in certain circumstances except, ex, expected, to, to ask the finders of fact to explore the reasons for that departure uh, and perhaps come eventually to some extreme conclusions. But the difficulty here is that what is the truth? Now, here we have a, a situation where the prosecution have, as we have, in our hands, the 
witness statement of this particular witness in which he asserts certain facts. He's now said that they are not his assertions, which really comes to this, that as far as he's concerned, uh, to the extent that he knows of those facts, they're not true. The prosecution is saying that what he said in his statement is true. But the difficulty is that the prosecution know full well they've got no corroborative evidence of anything this man says. And so they're making, making that application from that position. There is no independent corroboration of what this witness says. And I use the word independent in the sense that lawyers would use the word independent. But uh, as I said, I, I, I'm not in a position, and nor do I seek on behalf of Mr. Ruto, to stand in the way of the application that's been made. Thank you very much, Mr. Hooper. Mr. Kigen Katwa. Your Honour, on our part, we leave the question of whether to declare this witness hostile to the Chamber. We, however, wish to say on our part that uh, when the prosecution says that as one of the grounds upon which they are making the application, the witness has supported the defense case, we contest that. We are not aware of any instance when the witness, in the testimony so far adduced, has said anything that is supportive of the defense case. Uh, we also contest the contention that so How about far the suggestion that the or rather the allegation quite clear from the testimony of the witness that the investigator had put those facts together in the statement and made him sign it. Isn't that if it, it believed uh, something that supports the case for the defense? Not necessarily in the sense uh, that uh, I, the, the point on our part, um, Your Honor, is that the in, sense, in the sense that the prosecutor would go all out to uh, fabricate evidence uh, against the defense, or what else could they have done in the case? It is our submission that that is an issue of professional ethics rather than a question of uh, having taken a position that is defensive of the, that is, assist, that is of assistance to the defense. Mr. Kigenkato, you were telling me that if it is a case that objectively it is established that the prosecutor fabricated evidence in some respect, that you will not argue at the end of the day that this is something that the chamber should take into account in assessing the guilt or innocence of your client. Is that what you're saying? No, we would of course take that. We would take advantage of that position, Mr. President. So then, what? it's not a matter merely of professional ethics, uh, Mr. President. I will leave that issue there. Uh, the last issue I wish to raise, uh, Your Honour, is that um, we, we do not quite agree that the questions that have been put to this witness so far are all entirely neutral. We submit that there are instances when uh, the cross-examination has already been done. But the bottom line, Your Honours, is that we do not, uh, we, we, we leave it to you uh, to determine whether or not to have this woman declared hostile. All right, while you're on your feet, Mr. King Katwa, um, so far would it be a correct appreciation that this witness is not, at least from what the review of the statement, uh, has not touched your client in a direct way? He hasn't, Your Honour. Uh, he hasn't. I confirm that. Uh, 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 it wasn't the determination I made. I just asked you the question. I indeed, he hasn't, Your Honour. Uh, could, could I explain why I have... Uh, no, 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 no. The reason is, um, would you then see a need to cross-examine? I just want to you know for purposes of planning. Uh, yes, Your Honour. I, I would really have to cross-examine out of caution uh, that if the prosecution at the end of it come back with the application under Article 68 and in the recent past their suggestion that they could also seek to have the statement brought in for its truth under Article 69, 
I would need to have addressed the allegations he had made initially. All right. Um, Thank you, Mr. President, for uh, this opportunity. Your Honours, we support the prosecution's application. Uh, in our observation, the manner this witness has answered the questions posed by the prosecution fulfills all, if not most, of the, the five criteria that you all established on your last decision declaring witness hostile issued on 8th uh, of September. Your Honours, we also would like to highlight the fact that this witness has departed to the largest degree possible from the statement he had given uh, to the prosecutor's investigators. We, honest, we couldn't imagine a situation where a witness could uh, depart even more uh, than this witness did in the circumstances. Your Honours, we also would like to highlight the fact that this witness appears to us clearly and deliberately impugning the prosecution's case and also, this witness appears to be clearly supportive of the defense case. Your Honor, therefore, we believe that there is no need to further require the prosecution counsel to continue his questioning uh, using neutral forms of questions. Therefore, Your Honor, we believe that this time for Your Honor to allow uh, the prosecution to question uh, this witness with closed and leading questions. Your Honor, we, we would also add uh, and that this is important for your honors to hear the testimony of this witness and assess the evidence that he provides after allowing the prosecution to explore all the avenues possible. Uh, through this, through th such vigorous testing of this evidence, your honors will be able to arrive at the, uh, uh, the proper conclusion of this case and this is also important for the ascertainment of the truth, Your Honor. This concludes our submission. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we render our ruling. The, this is the second time the prosecution is making an application to have the witness they have called declared a hostile witness. Uh, the first time was on the occasion of the testimony of witness 604. Uh, as regards the present application, uh, all parties and participants do not, have not argued, none of the parties and participants, I should say, um, has argued that the circumstances of this witness's testimony thus far is any different, or are any different from those under which witness 604 uh, was declared hostile witness in particular. On that previous occasion, uh, the Chamber considered that the extensive degree to which the witness's testimony had consistently and systematically diverged from the statement that the witness had given to the prosecution uh, was enough to warrant having the witness declared hostile and the uh, prosecution application on that occasion was granted. Similarly, uh, it is granted in this instance for the same reason. So the witness may be brought back in and the prosecutor may proceed. Um, Mr. Kassia has indicated yesterday uh, you have to finish this thing today, the, your examination in Chile. Now, cross-examination as it were, of this witness. Indeed, Your Honor. Today. Okay. Mr. President, I will bring in the witness.
Mr. President, the witnesses in the room. Thank you very much, and witness, welcome back. Um, the prosecutor will continue questioning you. Mr. Garcia. Morning, Mr. Witness. Morning to you, sir. Now, court officer, I'd like to uh, put to the witness document 0084-0256. At page 0260, please. Where is your tab? Tab 9, Your Honor. Mr. Garcia, the page 0260 is presented to the witness. Now, Mr. Witness, uh, yesterday we went through this notebook of yours, and actually we, le we left off discussing certain parts of it. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like for you to look at this uh, page, and the writing at the top says, the real names of those beaten from... We, we are in the public session, remember that? Yes, Your Honor, I'm mindful of that. Now, the, the, the title at the top of this page, and I'll not name the, the, the village in question, but it says, the real names of those beaten from village, and it has a list of ten names there. Do you see that? Yes, Your Honor. Now, if you look at the entry at number one, there's numbers next to it. It starts out with 07. Do you see that? Yes, Your Honor. What is that number exactly? I believe this is the number for a phone call. So it's the phone number of a person that was beaten uh, from the village in question. Is that it? Yes, Your Honor. Am I right in saying, Mr. Witness, that this uh, phone number doesn't appear anywhere in the statement that we are looking at, the 17-page statement, which you've initialed and signed at the front and at the back? Am I correct in saying that? I'm not getting your question, uh, Your Honor. Mr. Witness, this information, the phone number of that first person, I'll not mention the name, is it correct to say that this phone number doesn't appear in the statement? The statement that you made to the OTP, the 17-page statement we've been speaking about for a day and a half. I can't remember whether it, it appears. The Mr. Witness, you've uh, listed uh, ten names there of people that were beaten from the village in question. Is that correct? I repeat your question, Your Honor. Mr. Witness, you've listed there at the top, it says real names of those beaten from village. And you've listed ten names. So these are ten names indicating people who have been beaten from, from that village. Is that correct? From the information in the page, the ten names are there. But I don't know the people. Now, you say you don't know the people, Mr. Witness. Am I correct in stating that most of these names don't even appear in the statement? The tenth name doesn't appear in the statement. The eighth name doesn't appear. The seventh, the sixth, the fifth, the fourth, the third, the second. All right, Mr. Garcia, it's beginning to look like you're making closing submissions. Mr. Witness, would you agree with me that the almost entirety of these names that are there, the ten names, do not appear in the statement that you gave to the OTP? I can't remember whether it appears because I have not gone through my, my statements. 
I'll ask that the uh, statement be put to the witness, page 0080248, please. Tab 7, Your Honor. A paper copy of page 0248 is presented to the witness. Now, Mr. Witness, if you read on this page 0248, and it's, uh, it's entitled 31st December 2007, paragraph 74 and onwards, You'll see paragraph 75 says the youth brought back maybe 15 people from a village. Do you see that? Yes, Your Honor. And then you continue, they were, they were asked why they had not come to the meeting. The next sentence says, one was, and you give the name of the person, and you say his wife was also brought, and you give the reasons why she had been brought. And then you go on to explain what happened to these people. And in paragraph 76, you give out more information on what happened to you. Do you see that? Yes, Your Honor. Now, do you see anywhere in this, uh, in this list or this indication of you've given during the statement of the people that were I, I did not indicate the names these names in my statement but I had to write in the notepads but once again mr. witness where did you get these names from all the names and all the information I got it from there yes but mr. witness I, I've just put to you the fact that in your statement you don't speak about these names. It's only in the handwritten notes. How do you explain that? So, Mr. Witness, you've had a certain time to think about that. How do you explain that to the court, that there are names here from people that were beaten in other villages that you don't make mention of in your statement? How do you explain that? If I had mentioned them in my statement, it would look a repetition of the same statement, but I had to make it different a bit to show that it was done earlier than when the statement was written. So, are you telling us that you invented these other names? The names were there, but I was given to Baghdad them. I'm afraid I, I don't understand you. You're saying that you added other names that maybe were not in the statement. Are, are these names that you invented? People that don't exist? It's not me who invented. I got the names there. Now, Mr. Witness, I'd like you to go to page uh, 0080266 of this same notebook. Mr. Garcia, what is the object of this exercise? Well, it's directly in regards directly to the witness's contention that this uh, document was handwritten by him in order uh, that he had been asked to handwrite the information to corroborate the statement. Now that's exactly what I'm addressing in these questions. So the object of your line of question, isn't it to say that the witness should not be believed in that assertion? Isn't that the object of your... That's correct, Your Honor. All oh, right. Um, just keep an eye when you're overdoing it. See, when you've done enough, and move on. And the defense have their chance. Certainly, Your Honor. I just have a couple of questions and I'll move on. Now, Mr. Witness, uh, page 0080266, do you have that before you? Yes, Your Honor. Now, uh, 
If you read the bottom half of that page, it starts with other, and I'll not say the next word, that you submitted to an office. Do you read that sentence? I'm not getting it properly, Your Honor. Can we go into private session, Your Honor, for two, three minutes? Private session. <laughs> We're in open session, Mr. President. Now, Mr. Witness, when did you speak with the with members of the OTP for the first time? Though I can't remember properly, Your Honor, it was around December, November or December of 2012. Is this the date on, are you referring to the date on which uh, you met with the investigators to give uh, your statement, the 17-page statement? It was before I went to the location to give the statement. So I just want to understand this. You had already spoken with members of the OTP before you gave your statement from the 8th to the 11th. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. For the first time, they made a call to me. I'd ask to go in private session five minutes, Your Honor. Mr. Garcia, there was some submission that Mr. Hooper made. And we, we did not consider that it was determinative of the question whether or not his witness will be declared hostile. That's a separate matter. But it also remains a question of the purpose of the exercise that you were engaged in, what it is you are seeking to achieve by this exercise, with an eye always firmly placed on the charges that the court would have to determine at the end of the day. Um, if what I'm going to say next is not the case, Mr. Hooper will rise and rectify it. But from his suggestion, it was fairly dismissive of whether or not anything needs to be made of this witness. Uh, if he thinks that he has the witnesses to believe, he will say so, Mr. Hooper. But if it is the case that the defense are not going to say yes, rely on this witness for anything, you need to consider how much you should be cross-examining this witness. I say no more. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm guided by the Chamber. <clears throat> I just need to go into private session for five minutes. Private session. We're in open session, Mr. President. Now, Mr. Witness, just before we go to the first break, I'd like to ask just one question of clarification. Yesterday I was asking you questions, and, and there's something you said that I'm still not clear on, and I'd just like you to explain it if you can. And we were speaking about person number, to number two telling you about the investigators and being called. And you responded, after I was called by the investigators and given the document, I had to make a call to her and ask her whether there was a problem in that statement. And this is the part that interests me. You say, quote, but she had already confirmed to me that the statement that you are going to get, don't worry about it, that is what 
I also did. Can you explain what you mean by that? Your Honor, I mean that immediately after being given the statement and writing them, then I had to call her to confirm to her that what she told me is exactly what I've got. All right, but the part where you're saying, but she had already confirmed to me that the statement that you're going to get, don't worry about it, that is what I also did. What does that mean, that is what I also did? Who are you referring to? I was referring that because she had told me that you don't worry about it, the, your work was only to sign it, then I was referring that I also did the signing of the document. I, di I just want, if you can, to clarify this just a bit more. In regards to this person number two, do you know if she had done it already, given a statement or not at that point? Your Honor, repeat your question. When you're saying that is what I also did, now I just want to understand, to your knowledge at the time, had this person number two given a statement to the OTP or not? Your Honor, I never know whether he had, she had given her statement or not, because what she told me is exactly what I got with the OTP. Your Honors, I see the time. We will take our morning break. All rise. We will be.